Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ahdahu la sharika lah Wa anna muhammadan abduhu rasuluhu Sallallahu alaihi wa ala alihi wa sahabihi jma'in Amma ba'd So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He was brought back to Mecca After Going up the heavens, the Mi'raj, he went back to the Bayt al-Baqdis, Jerusalem, Al-Aqsa, and he came back to Mecca with the company of Jibreel on the animal called Al-Buraq. On the way back, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like we said, he saw a caravan of some people of the Quraysh, and he, no, uh, he recognized them. He recognized them. And in fact, he stopped there and they had some water. He got off and he drank from that water because they were sleeping. Because they were sleeping. And then he continued back to Mecca. When he woke up the next day, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, When I woke up the next day, I عرفت أن الناس مكذبية، فقعدت معتزلا حزيرا. I woke up the next day. I knew that the people are going to deny or belie me. They're not going to believe me about what I'm going to tell them. So I sat alone, and I was very sad and dejected because he knew that people are going to reject him. What he's going to tell them that he was taken on the night journey. فمر عدو الله أبو جهل. While I was in that state, seated like that, the enemy of Allah, Abu Jahl, he passed by me. And as you have known, it is a very hostile situation or place in Mecca environment, and they used to make fun of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. When he passed by him, he said to him, "Oh Muhammad, is there something you?" He said to him, Oh Muhammad, is there something new? Kabustahzi'i, as if he's making fun of me. So the Prophet ﷺ told him, He said, Naam, yes. He said, What is it? He said, Innahu usri abi layla. Last night I was taken on a journey. Qal Abu Jahl, he said, To where? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Ila Bayt al Baqdis. To Bayt al Baqdis al Aqsa in Jerusalem. He said, and then in the morning you're here with us. Like we said, that is a, a month's journey back then. You went in one night and you came back. And now in the morning you're here with us. And the Prophet said, yes. So Abu Jahl tried to be smart. He did not want the Prophet to reject the words after. He said, wait, if I called all of your people, are you going to say the same words? So he has so many more witnesses. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said yes. So he screamed on the top of his voice. Ya Ba'ashara Bani Ka'ab ibn Lu'ay. He called all the Arabs of Mecca. And they all came to him. When they came, he said, Tell your people what you told me. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Inni usri abi al-layla. Last night I was taken on a night journey. They said, to where? He said, to Bayt al-Baqdis. And then you're back this morning. He said, yes. They started to scream. Some of them started to hit their heads in amazement. Some of them started to clap their heads in amazement and shock. And it was a great fitna, a great test. Some of those who are Muslims, they left Islam at that moment. Because it's impossible. It's like you saying that you went all the way to um, India and you came back the same light. 
Even by airplane, it's impossible. Even by airplane, it's impossible. So a journey of a month, you went in one night and you came back in the morning you're with us. So even some of those who are Muslims who are weak Iman, they left Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains about this event in Surah Al-Isra. وَمَا جَعَلْنَا الرُّؤْيَ الَّتِي عَرَيْنَاكَ إِلَّا فِتْنَةً لِلنَّاسِ وَالشَّجَرَةَ الْمَلْعُونَةَ فِي الْقُرْآنِ وَنُخَوِّفُهُمْ فَمَا رَزِيدُهُمْ إِلَّا تُغْيَانًا كَبِيرًا And we have not bad. The vision of what you saw, meaning the experience of what you saw during the right journey, except that it was a fitna, a test. It was a test. While they were doing this, some of them left. And those who left, they met Abu Bakr. When they met Abu Bakr, they said, Oh, did you hear what your friend is saying today? He said, What is he saying? He said that he was taken last night. He went all the way to wait al Maqdis. Imagine the Prophet did not say, I even went to the seventh heaven. They couldn't even take this part only. He said that he went all the way to wait al Maqdis, and in the morning he's here with us now. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he said, Wallahi la in kana qalahu laqad sadaqt. If he said it, if he really said it, then he is truthful. They said, you believe him in that? He said, yes, I believe him in something which is greater than that. Ya'atihi al-khabaru min al-saba. The revelation comes from the seven heavens, morning and evening. That is greater than him just going to Bait al and coming back. And that is why Abu Bakr was called a Siddiq. The one who testifies to the truth. Or the one who is truthful in his Iman. That is why he is called a Siddiq. Now they, of course, could not take it, the Quraysh. And of course, this was another opportunity for them to make fun of the Prophet Sallallahu and to prove, for them it's a proof that Islam is a false religion. So what did they do? They said to him, you said you went to Bayt al-Baqdis. فَهَلْ تَسْفِفْ لَنَا أَوْ هَلْ تَسْتَطِيعُ تَسْفِفْ لَنَا Bayt al-Baqdis? Can you describe it to us? Because some of them had been there. They had gone many times. They know Bait al-Maqdis. And one of them is a man called Al-Mut'ib ibn Adi. In fact, he's the one who asked. You say you went to Bait al-Maqdis? Okay, then describe it to us. And he was one of those who had been there several times. He knew Bait al-Maqdis very well. The Prophet wasallam said, my brothers and sisters, at this moment, he said, I have never been stressed at any moment, the way I was stressed at this moment. Because now they're saying, okay, describe it, prove it. I have never been stressed. He said, لَقَدْ رَأَيْتُنِي فِي الْحِجْرِ وَقُرَيْشُ تَسْأَلُنَا عَنْ بَسْرَاءَ فَسَأَلَتْلِي عَنْ أَشْيَاءَ بِبَيْتِ الْبَقْدِ سَلَمْ أُثْبِتْهَا فَكُرِبْتُ قُرْبَةً مَا كُرِبْتُ مِثْلَهُ قَدْ فَرَفَعَهُ اللَّهُ بَلَى اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَ تَعَالَى مُتِبُّ نُورَهُ Allah completed his light, his guidance. وَلَوْ كَرِهَا الْكَافِرُونَ الْمُشْرِكُونَ Even if the kafirun and the mushrikun don't like it. So Allah سبحانه وتعالى gave him another miracle. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said فَرَفَعَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَيَّ أَنظُرُ إِلَيْهِ Allah showed me a vision. Allah showed it to me, I was looking at it, and I started describing it. The door is at this place, this color, and the windows are here, and it is made of this, and this wall has that, and that pillar has that. And every detail I mentioned, Al-Muti bin Adi, and those who had seen Al-Bayt al-Baqdis, they are saying, he's true, he's true, he's true. أَلْعَتُ حَتَّى الْتَبَسَ عَلَيَّ بَعْضُ اللَّعْتِ فَجِيَا بِالْبَسْجِدِ وَأَلَا أَذْضُرُ حتى وضع دور دار عقيل فلعته ولا أذر إليه فلب فرقة باللعتي قال مشركون أب اللعت فوالله ما أصاب فوالله لقد أصاب عفوا 
They said, as for his description, he is saying the truth. Now, this was a good moment for them to believe, right or wrong? Because the Prophet sallallahu had never been to Bayt al-Maqdis. They knew that, number one. He had never been to Bayt al-Maqdis. Number two, he's saying, I was there last night. And you say, okay, then describe it. And he's describing it now, every detail. Every detail. That is a miracle. And then he told them, and another sign, I'll give you another sign that I'm telling the truth. I passed by a caravan of so and so and so and so and so and so, he mentioned the names. And they had this camel and they were sleeping. I had the, they had the water which they covered. I opened the water and took a drink of it. When they arrived in Mecca, I asked them, were they with this camel and that camel and that camel and they were sleeping at this place? When those people came a few days after, they were asked and they said, yes, it's true. But subhanAllah, they were amazed, the Quraysh, but they never believed. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the verses, or sorry, the signs we reveal to them only increase them in tughiyana, only increase them in transgression. وَمَا يَزِيدُهُمْ إِلَّا تُغْيَانًا كَبِيرًا So this was the story of Al-Isra al-Mi'raj and this was the result of it. Those who believed, they became stronger believers, and some of them, like we said, they left Islam. As for the lessons we learned, we mentioned so many lessons. Now, this morning, after this event happened, the same day Jibril came to the Prophet ﷺ. And this was when he came and taught the Prophet وسلم, the timings of the prayer. It was the morning after Isra al Bi'raj. You know the long hadith. The long hadith. Where Jibril came. And he prayed with the Prophet وسلم, the beginning of the time of Fajr. And then he prayed with the beginning of the time of Dhuhr. And then he became and he prayed in the beginning of Asr, beginning of Maghrib, beginning of Isha. And he said, pray when this time comes in. And th the day after he came again and he prayed with him at the end of the time of Fajr, at the end of time of Dhuhr, at the end of time of Asr, the end of Maghrib and the end of Isha. And he said to him, every prayer, these are his times. That is the beginning time and the end time. You guys know the timings of the prayer. Don't tell me, yes, Sheikh, you know, Asr is 2.30 today. That's not what I'm asking. How do you establish the prayer timings? Who knows? Not one prayer. I want you to tell me all of the prayers. Okay, Bismillah, start. Now, you use the sun, yes, how do you use the sun? Huh? Yes. It's when you see what? You should be uh, listening. You see what? A white line. Is it crooked or is it straight line? Fajr begins when you see a white line on the horizon. You know what the horizon is? That's when Fajr begins. Okay. When does it end? When does it end? Shuruq, which is sunrise, when the sun rises. Tayyib. When does Dhuhr start? When the sun is at the middle of the sky 
And when you look at the shade, it's around you. You don't see the shed. No, there's always a shed. The shed never disappears. Even when the sun is on top, the shed never disappears. The shed is always there. So you just pray Dhuhr before it's time. Very good. That's what you're trying to say. It's after the sun passes the middle. The middle is called the zenith. After it passes the zenith and it goes to the west a bit. Because, you know, the sun rises from the east. And it goes up until it's at the middle, the zenith. This is called midday. It's called midday. That's when the shadow is the most minimal. You understand? Because the light is shining directly. When the sun just goes to the middle... Where will the shadow go? This is basic physics they taught you in school. Look, let's say this is the east. This is the east. The sun comes out. The sun is your source of light. Where is the shadow going to be of this object? This way, right? Here, this is the shadow. Right or wrong? And as the sun rises, the shadow is the longest. As it goes up, it becomes short. As it goes up, the angle, be the angle becomes shorter, the shadow becomes shorter, or the angle becomes smaller. Until when the sun is up in the middle, it is the most minimal shadow. You understand? This is now midday, zenith, the, the noon, if you want to call it noon. It's not 12 o'clock, it's midday. When the sun goes to the west, the shadow automatically comes this side now. Because the source of light is from this side. So the shadow is here. Once that appears, Dhuhr has started. Once that appears, Dhuhr has started. Say, when does it end? Very good. When does Dhuhr end? When the shadow becomes long, 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 until it's the same length as the object. Plus, remember, plus that minimal shadow which is always there. When the shadow easily, we say when the shadow is equal to the object, eh, plus that minimal shadow, then Dhuhr has ended. Dhuhr has ended. When does Asr start? Dhuhr and Asr, they interchange, they are automatic. If Dhuhr ends, Asr starts right away. So that's when Asr starts, when the shadow of the object is the same length as it is, plus the minimal shadow. Asr starts there. And that's the majority of the madhabs, except the Hanafi madhab. The Hanafi madhab, the Hadith says, Mithla, when the shadow is the same length as the object. They understood the hadith, it says, Bithlayhi, when the shadow is double. That is why the Hanafi Bastis, they pray later. That is the reason, Asr. Okay? So Asr starts there. Where does it end? Huh? When it's double. When it's three times. When does Asr end? Sunset. Zakallah khair, Shaykh. Sunset. When the sun sets, that's when Maghrib, uh, sorry, I just gave away the answer. That's when Asr ends. Lakin, Asr has the recommended time and then it has general time. You should pray Asr as soon as possible. But if you miss that, you can pray until sunrise, uh, sunset, sorry. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Man adraka raka'a, whoever prays one full raka'a, stood up, he read, he made ruku'a, got up, sabi Allah bil hamida, he made sajda, another sajda, got up. If you made one raka'a before the sun sets, you have caught asr. But of course, you don't do that. You don't delay your salah, especially salat al-asr. 
When does Maghrib start? When the sun? When the sun sets. Meaning when it is dark, right? Huh? Stop writing. If you're writing, you won't understand. You won't get what I'm saying. Because it's not a fiqh of salah cause today. I'm just passing through. When does Maghrib start? You said sunset. I'm saying, does that mean darkness? No. Huh? No, you still see the sun a bit. Sunset does not mean darkness. I just want to emphasize that point. Sunset does not mean darkness. When the sun sets, beginning of Maghrib, there's still enough light. If you are to drop even a 25 cent coin, you can see it, let alone a hundred dollar bill. That one, if you drop it even at midnight, people can see it. A hundred dollar bill, if you drop it, inshallah, if there's no electricity, people can see it. Taim, that's where Maghrib starts. When does Maghrib end? When it's become dark. It becomes dark 10 minutes into Maghrib. Huh? When does Maghrib end? I can't hear you, sorry. Where? Very good. When the redness of the clouds disappears. When it is dark, but I ask you, dark where? No, anywhere. In the west, that's where the sun sets. You know when the sun sets, the sun and the sky turns into what? Yellowish, orange, this kind of colors, beautiful. That's why people pay money to go watch the sunset. Right or wrong? You pay money. Then the sun, it sets completely. The colors turn darker to red. It's called Shafaqul Ahmar. When that red color disappears in the sky, now it's completely dark, the sky. It shows you Maghrib has ended, and automatically Isha has started. And automatically Isha has started. And this disappearance of the clouds does not take just 20 minutes, no. It takes at least an hour for us. For us, Toronto, Ottawa, it takes at least, at least an hour, if not an hour, 15 minutes. So I'm saying this because some of us, we have the idea that, no, Maghrib is only 10 minutes, and that's it, no. You can pray Maghrib all this time. The Prophet, sallam, one day he read Surah Al-A'raf in Maghrib. You know how long is A'raf? 200 verses. It's a whole juz. And one day Umar, he read Al-Baqarah in Surah in Surat Al-Fajr. When they finished, it was light, completely daytime. He said, as long as we prayed the first raka in Fajr, the second raka we can make it as long as we want. That's besides the point. When does Isha end? Midnight. Fajr. Okay. Another opinion, statement. When Tahajjud starts, why does that though? Huh? First third of the night. Okay. The midpoint between Maghrib and Fajr. That's called the half of the night. And that is the correct answer. Listen. Don't write. Listen so you understand. Then you write after. The middle of the night. It's not called midnight. I'm not going to say midnight because we know midnight is 12, 12, 12, 12. No. The middle of the night. Middle of the night or half the night. That's when Isha is ended. It's not Fajr. It's not Fajr. How do you know the middle of the night? The sister said it very well. The beginning of Maghrib is the beginning of the night. The beginning of Fajr is the beginning of the day. How long this is, divide by two, that is the middle of the night. So, is it midnight, 12 o'clock? No, why? Very good, because the seasons change. In winter, we have long nights. 
In Saba, we have short nights. Yes. It's very important. Fajr does not go to, uh, sorry, Isha does not go to Fajr. That is not Isha. It stops at the middle of the night. Now, let's do an actual uh, calculation today. Today. What time is Maghrib today? Okay, 4.45. Great. What time does Fajr come in? 5.30. It was 5.32 yesterday. Okay, 5.30. How long is this night? From 4.45 to 5.30. How long is the night? You have to be precise. Precise. 12 hours, 45 minutes. Nice. That is how long the night is. 12 hours, 45 minutes. What is half of 12 hours and 45 minutes in hours and minutes? No. Six hours, 22 and a half minutes. Right? Six hours, 22 and a half minutes. That's your middle of the night. Meaning your night is 12, and 12 hours, 45 minutes. Middle of the night is this, how, this long. You take that time, six hours and 22 minutes, and add it to Maghrib from the beginning. Now you know the middle of the night. So Maghrib is 445. Add six hours to it. 10 45. 10 Add the 22 minutes. 11 o'clock. If you pray after 11, you did not pray Fajr. You, miss, you did not pray Isha. You missed your Isha. It's very important. That's why I deviated for our Sira for me to say this. It's very important. That is how you calculate the times of the prayers. That is how you calculate the time of the prayers. Is it clear? Yeah, same thing. Qiyamul Layl starts after, after Isha ends. Qiyamul Layl starts after Isha ends. The Sahaba, radiallahu anhu, like Abu Huraira and others, they would pray the Isha and then stand up and pray the Qiyamul Layl and pray with her and sleep. Because the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, told them that is one of the best things you can do. You pray before you sleep. And then there's the better Qiyamul Layl. The better Qiyamul Layl is to pray when, after you sleep and then wake up. As long as it's before Fajr. That is the better one. Taib, if you do not understand me, Alhamdulillah, the brothers are doing a good job recording this. You'll go back to the recording. We have to move on with the Seerah. So we are back in Mecca. They rejected. Some of the believers believed. They affirmed Al-Isra'u. Well, Bi'raj. That's, that same day, Jibril came and taught the Prophet وسلم, the times of the prayers. That's where we are. And Allahu A'lam, it seems that I'm just supposing, I could be wrong. This was also the time he was taught al wudu, because you have to do wudu before as salah. And like I said yesterday, and there's a few questions which came. The Salah was prescribed to Fajr, to Dhuhr, to Asr, three Maghrib, to Isha. That is how they prayed. Until after the migration to Medina, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed it, that Fajr was still two, but Dhuhr became four, and Asr became four. Maghrib stayed three, and Isha became four. And that is for the resident, but if you're a traveler, you still pray the way it was supposed to be prayed, two, two. Two, for Dhuhr, Asr, and Isha. That is how it happened. And that hadith is reported by Imam Ahmad, if you want the reference for that. And also Al-Bukhari from the hadith of Aisha. She said, Faraballahu salata hira farabaha raka'atayni raka'atayni fil habari was safari. Allah obligated the salah when he obligated it was two, 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 two. Whether you're a resident or a traveler. Wazida fi salati al habar, but then after those who are residents, they are told pray for Dhuhr, Asr, and Isha. Now, 
Where did they pray to? Their Qibla was Baytul Maqdis. Their Qibla was Baytul Maqdis. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he loved to face the Kaaba. So he would pray behind the Kaaba. Let's say this is the Kaaba, facing the direction of Baytul Maqdis. He's facing Quds from Mecca. Quds is what? North, right? Or a bit northwest, right? He would face that direction, but he would make sure the Kaaba is in front of him. Because he loved that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would make him face the Kaaba. And of course, this was changed after in Medina. That was after. Around this time, around this time also, a few events happened. Remember, we are in the 11th year end of 10th year, 11th year. There's a few notable people who became Muslims around this time. A few notable people who became Muslim. And the Sheikh, he mentions this in his book. Um, it is page number, let me just get it quickly. Because remember the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, just a few days ago, he was in Twaif trying to get some support. He still needs the support. So whenever the Arab tribes will come to Mecca for business or to do Umrah or especially Hajj at the end of the year, the Prophet Sallallahu will go to them and present himself to them. And he'll say to them, مَنْ يَحْمِلُنِ لَا قَوْمِهِ لِيُبَلِّغَ كَلَامَ رَبِّهِ Who is going to sponsor me basically? Who is going to be my patron, defend me? And take me to his people so I can tell them the words of my Lord. Because Quraysh is preventing me from calling people to my Lord. He met different tribes. Um, if you're on page 169, the Sheikh he mentions here, um, the second paragraph, page 169. He says, on the authority of Az-Zuhri, of the tribes that Islam was introduced to, we could speak of Banu Amr ibn Su'asa, Wuhari ibn Khaswa, to the end. He mentioned so many tribes. They, however, remained persistent and none of them responded positively. None of them responded positively. from the people who the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam preached to is a man called Suwaid ibn Sabit, page 170 at the bottom. Now this story, I saw some of the ulama, they said it's not established because there's nothing really to prove it. But Suwaid ibn Sabit, he was one of the great poets of the Arabs. And we discussed that the greatest people of Arabia at that time are the poets. It's the poet. The poet is the one who's the most noble of all people. Suwaid bin Sabit was an intelligent poet from Yathrib. And he had good judgment. His people called him Al-Kamil, the one who's perfect. The one who is perfect. Because of his lineage, he, was a good, he had a good lineage. His poetry was one of the best poetry. And his nobility and family. During his stay in Mecca for the pilgrimage, Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam invited him to Islam. And Suwaidi said, maybe what I have, my poetry is better than what you have, Muhammad. And he said to him, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to him, what do you have? He said, I have some of the hikmah of Luqman. I have some of the hikmah, wisdom of Luqman, which he said to his son. So he said to he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said to him, okay, present it to me. He presented it, and the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, that, that speech is good. Yet what I have is better than this. It is a Quran that Allah, the Most High, revealed to me. It is guidance and light. And he recited to him the Quran. When Suwaid had the Quran, he knew that this is not poetry. This is not the words of a human being. We we'll mentioned this here before. The greatest miracle our Prophet was given was not Israel Mi'raj. It was not the splitting of the moon. 
It was not water coming out of his fingers. Those are great miracles. The greatest miracle is the Quran. When Suwayd heard those words of the Quran, right away he accepted Islam. He went back to Medina where he was killed in the fighting between the Aus and the Khazraj. Listen carefully. Stop writing. Don't write right now. He was killed. He went back to Medina. He was killed in the fighting between the Aus and the Khazraj. These are the two tribes of Medina. Prayer to the battle of Bu'ath. You have to memorize that because it's part of the Sira, very important part of the Sira. The Aus and the Khazraj are the two Arab tribes of Medina. And we know soon we are going to go to Medina. And the great event which prepared Medina for Islam was the battle of Bu'ath. Anyway, I'm going to move on. Now you can write. Suwaid was killed before that. It is said he did some da'wah, he did not do some da'wah, Allahu a'ala. Because the scholar were trying to prove when did Islam enter Madinah. He died anyways. Another man, who became Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu presented Islam to him, was a man or a young boy called Iyas ibn Mu'adh. Iyas ibn Mu'adh. He was still a youth from the Aus tribe. He was still a youth from the Aus tribe. I'm reading from page 171. He came as a member of a delegation seeking alliance with the Quraysh against another rival tribe dwelling in Madinah, al Khazraj. So the Aus and the Khazraj used to fight a lot. So they came to Mecca to seek allies from the Quraysh in fighting the Khazraj. This was during the 11th year of prophethood. Around the time of the battle of Bu'ath, the Aus tribe was less in number than the Khazraj. They came for seeking allies and support in fighting, but the Prophet ﷺ was giving da'wah to anyone who came. The Prophet met with them and advised them, saying, maybe there's something better for you than what you came for. They said, what would that be? He replied, I am Allah's messenger, Ana Rasulullah. He sent me to the worshippers to invite them to worship Allah alone without associating partners with him. And he revealed the book to me. And he told them about Islam and he recited the Quran to them. This young boy was the youngest of them. Iyas ibn Mu'adh. He said, Ya Qawmi, all my people, this is better than what you came for. And Abu al-Husayr, Anas ibn Rafi', he took a handful of dust and threw it in Iyas's face and said, get away from us. We came here to seek allies to fight Khazraj. The people left Medina. They left Mecca, not Medina, sorry, that's a mistake. Page 172 at the top. Then the people left Mecca after having failed in establishing alliance with the Quraysh. Shortly after arrival in Medina, the boy, Iyas bin Mu'adh, he breathed, he breathed his last, sorry, acclaiming Allah's name, and he died as a Muslim. And then there was this great man called Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, who's story to Islam, I'll reserve it today because I want to do it properly. And we'll discuss it tonight, inshallah, because Sheikh Ismail invited me to participate in his halakha today, in his normal Sunday halakha. So I think, because we are debating what topic we should talk about, I'm going to talk about how Abu Dhar al-Ghifari became Muslim. Because there's a lot to learn. So we will jump that. Another man called Tufail ibn Amr al dawsi bottom of page 173. Tufail ibn Amr, his story is amazing also. He was an honest poet also. And the chief of Ad-Dawus. Ad-Dawus is the tribe of who? Who's the most famous man from Ad-Dawus? 
Abu Huraira. You know the guy called Abu Huraira? Yeah, he narrated like half of the religion to you. He's a Dausi from the tribe of Daus. But at this time, Tufail ibn Amr was the chief, inhabiting an area close to Yemen in South Arabia. He arrived in Mecca in the 11th year of prophethood, and great reception ceremonies were accorded to him on his arrival. The Arabs of Quraysh knew how great this man is. He is a poet, and he is a chief of his people. The Meccans stood started to say over and over in all his ears all sorts of op opposition against the Prophet Sallallahu They used to do that, we mentioned this before. Anyone who came to Mecca, they'll say what? Ihdar bin Muhammad. Beware of Muhammad. La yaftinuk. He will put you into a fitna. He is crazy. He wants to change your religion, the religion of your father. They used to say this to everyone. So they said this to Tufail. They even alleged that he had caused the most horrible societal split, page 174, dividing all sorts of social life, even the family ties were subject to his schemes and plans of disagreement. They even warned him against speaking or even listening to him, the Prophet They said, don't even listen to him. But when the tribesman went to the mosque, he saw the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Pray. He saw him praying salah. And out of curiosity, he approached him, for it was the divine decree. That was the qadr. After all the words Quraysh gave him, when he saw the Prophet ﷺ praying, he couldn't hold back himself. He said, I have to go ask him. So he went to the Prophet. ﷺ. When the Prophet started to speak to him, he wanted more. The temptation to hear more was irresistible. So he followed the Prophet ﷺ into his house. He briefed him on his advent and all of the stories of the people of Quraysh, how, what they did to him. Allah's Messenger ﷺ recited some verses of the Noble Quran and the man managed to test something exceptionally beautiful and distinguish the truth latent with it. He became Muslim. And because he was the chief of his people, Daus, he said, I'm going to call my people to Islam. But he wanted the Prophet ﷺ to make dua for them. The Prophet ﷺ, he, made, he supplicated for, to Allah for him. And in fact, a divinely light was bestowed in his whip. He was given a miracle to fail Ibn Amr. His whip, if he held it up, it became a light. He called, he went back to his people, he called his father and his wife to embrace Islam, and they responded. But his people, they were like, ah, we don't know about this Islam thing. He himself and others migrated to Medina after. But it is still, the story of Daus will come after. The story of Daus will come back to this great man called Abu Huraira. Anyway, one of the great people to become Muslim, one of the greatest stories, I want you to listen carefully. Stop writing, please. Dhimad al Azdi. Dhimad al Azdi. Here they say Dhimad. He came from Azd of Shanua of Yemen, the tribe of Azd, Shanua of Yemen. He was a specialist in kihana, incantation. Kihana is people who, are, who practice sorcery, magic. He arrived in Mecca to hear the fools there say that the Muhammad Sallallahu was out of his mind. He decided to practice his craft on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He decided to do, to show the Prophet that he can do whatever sorcery he can do. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called him. I said, listen to me. You know what the Prophet ﷺ said to him? The words you hear every Friday, but when you hear them, we're, we're sleeping in. He said, Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu, wa nasta'inuhu, wa nasta'ghfiruhu, wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa sayyiati a'malina, wa yahdillahu falamudilla lahu wa mayudlil falahadiya lahu, wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lahu wa anna muhammadan abdu wa rasooluh. 
It's called the khutbah to al-hajah. Every imam has to say it before he gives a khutbah. If you want to give a lecture, you say it. Before you get married, you say it in the aqd al-nikah. When the Prophet sallallahu finished, in alhamdulillah, the translation, all perfect praise is due to Allah. Huh? We praise him, nahmaduhu, wa nasta'inuhu, and we seek his assistance. Wa nasta'gfiruhu, we seek his forgiveness. Wa na'udhu billahi bil shuroori anfusina. We seek Allah's refuge from the evil of ourselves. Wa bil sayyi'ati amalina and from the evil of our actions. Because every action you do, which has evil, the sins, it has consequences after. So you ask Allah to save you from that. Ma yahdillah, whoever Allah guides, fala mudillalah. Nobody can misguide. And whoever Allah lets to go astray, nobody can guide. And I be a witness, wa ashadu, Allah ilaha illallah, that there is no true God who deserves to be worshipped except Allah. And that Muhammad is his slave and messenger. When Dumadi heard this, or Dumad, sorry, Al-Azdi, he said, A'idha alayya, say it again. The Prophet didn't even start his speech. Just the khutbah to al-hajj. He said, repeat. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi repeated it again. He said, again, third time. The Prophet sallallahu repeated it again. He said, I have heard the words of the Kuhad, the soothsayers, and the palm readers, and the magicians, and the sorcerers. I have, I have heard all of it. But never have I experienced the sweetness of your words. They have the depth of the ocean, and he became Muslim. This is in Sahih Muslim. It's an authentic hadith, with no doubt. He became Muslim by the khutbah al haja Those are great words. Only if we consider them. There is demand al-Azdi. And there was others, but we don't have that much time. The point here is, the point here is, the Prophet sallallahu was giving da'wah. We're repeating this point a lot. Even in the most hostile environment, his call to Allah never stopped. Okay, you don't want to believe, but anyone who's new, he has not heard the message. He's a foreigner who comes to Mecca. I'm going to speak to him. And look, most of us, if someone said about us, don't listen to him, he's crazy. He's a magician. He's a liar. He's a sorcerer. You go home running, crying. They said this about me. No. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, don't even consider that. I have a job to do. Let them say what they have to say. Because the haq, the truth, it has a sweetness, like the words of the man. It has a sweetness which is made for the human heart. The human heart, when it hears the truth, it says, this is the truth. And those of us, brothers and sisters, who became Muslim, who reverted to Islam, they will tell you that. The truth has a sweetness which just is compatible to the human heart. Your heart was created for that. It was created for that. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he continued um, giving da'wah. Now around this time, the 11th year, again, now we are in the 11th year, during the season of Hajj, remember we said these Arabs, even though they were on disbelief, they used still some of the traces of Islam from Ibrahim and Ismail alayhi salam still remain, like the Hajj. But we said, how did they do Hajj? Who remembers? Huh? Yes. They will do it naked. They will say, you know, these clothes, we sin, we disobey Allah in these clothes, no, we can't wear them in the haram of Allah. They used to respect the haram of Allah, the Kaaba, they say, remember? Yesterday we talked about what? When they put the intestines and stomach of the animal of the Prophet ﷺ was praying. And he stood up and made dua. They were shook. They were terrified. Why? They knew that, oh, if someone makes dua here, it's accepted. This is the haram of Allah. Remember when they wanted to rebuild the Kaaba, what did they do? Why is the Kaaba today not the full Kaaba? They said, only halal body. Only halal body. So they would go do tawaf around the Kaaba seven times, but they'll say these clothes, they're full of sins, man. So we'll do it naked. And the woman would say, What? Today, yes, I'm being seen, but it's not halal for anyone to touch me. And their tawaf will be what? 
Buka'a no tasniya, they'll be clapping and whistling. And they had a talbiya, just like we do talbiya today. Labbaik Allahumma labbaik. Oh Allah, I have heard your call, I have heard your call, I'm coming. Labbaik la sharika laka labbaik. I have heard your call, I'm coming, you have no partner. You know what they would say? Labbaik Allahumma labbaik. Labbaik la sharika laka illa sharikun huwa lak. Labbaik, you have no partner, Allah, except a partner who's yours. So they twisted the, the, the religion of Allah. Anyway, they used to come for Hajj. So when they would come for Hajj, the Prophet ﷺ would take advantage to call the people. In the 11th year, when the people of Medina came, we are reading on page 175. It was during the pilgrimage season, Hajj. In the 11th year of prophethood, that the Islamic call found the righteous seeds through which it would grow to constitute tall trees whose leaves will foster the new faith and shelter the new helpless converts from the blows of injustices and high handedness of the Quraysh. It was the Prophet Wasallam's wise practice to meet the delegates of the Arabian tribes by night so that the hostile Makkahs will not deter him from achieving his objectives. In the morning, he can't. Remember, in the morning, Abu Jahal, Abu Lahab, Abu Sufyan, Uqba bin Abi Mu'ayd, they tell people, don't listen to Muhammad, he's crazy. Don't listen to Muhammad, he's going to change your religion. When he comes, put your hands in your fingers. So the Prophet ﷺ will go to them at night, these people who came to Mecca, and speak to them. In the company of his true, two, sorry, truthful companions, Ali and Abu Bakr, عنهم, he had an interesting talk regarding, I don't like this word, some of the words the translator used, but regarding Islamization with Banu Duhal. What is Islamization? <laughs> you know? Basically, it means he gave them da'wah, he called them to Islam, he taught them about Islam. It's not the best word to use. But the latter suspended their conversion. Actually, what happened? The people of Banu Duhal, they said, you know, what you're saying is good. And one of them said, if you allow me, I'm going to go speak to my people. If they agree, we will support you completely. But when he went to speak to his people, they said, we are not ready to fight with the Quraysh. In pursuit of the same objective, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions, they passed by Aqaba in Mina. Aqaba is a mountain or a stone. It's called Aqaba in Arabic. Aqaba is a mountain or a high mountain or a stone. At Mina, Mina where people go and spend three days during Hajj, there is a place which was called Aqaba because there was a huge tall rock. Tayyip? There was a huge and tall rock. There, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he found people sitting and they were talking. And there were six people from Yathrib. Yathrib is the name of Medina before it was Medina. And it is haram for you to call it Yathrib today. Because Allah changed it and said, no, it's not Yathrib, it's Medina. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's not Yathrib. It's a Tayyiba, the pure land. Tayyib? Anyway, it's called Yathri back then. He saw six men. All of them, remember how many tribes of people of Medina are there? Who are they? The two tribes of people of Medina. Aus and Khazraj. He found six people from the tribe of Khazraj. Khazraj is the bigger tribe, the stronger one. Who are they? If you can memorize these names, you should. These are the greatest personalities of Islam. Now we're getting to the point that you got to get your names right. You don't have to. You don't have to. But if you're going to learn the seerah properly, you have to know the details. Yeah, because you can tell me, yeah, I know the first Canadian astronaut. That's good for you. You know, I know the first Prime Minister of Canada. That's good for you then why don't you want to know these great people? 
نمبر 1 اسعد بن زراره عوف بن حارث رافع بن مالك قطب بن عامر and عقبه بن عامر his brother and جابر بن عبد الله this is not the famous جابر we always hear جابر بن عبد الله said in the hadith no that's not him he was too young at this moment these six people and that is the benefit of having your book i don't have to repeat the names you know six times you have your book i'll repeat for those who don't have the book as'ad ibn zurara awf ibn harith rafi' ibn malik qutb ibn amir and uqba ibn amir and jabir ibn abdullah these people I love how in English they use the term Madanese, meaning they're from Medina. You know? Always they had heard the Jews in Medina. Remember, Medina was made of three tribes, or three, the, 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 what is the right word? The, the, uh, no, no. The demographical makeup of Medina. It was the Jews, and they were very powerful, the Jews, and the two tribes of the Arabs, Aus and Khazraj. And by the way, Aus and Khazraj come from the same grandfather. They, come, they are cousins. They are cousins. This was the makeup of Medina. Why were the Jews in Medina? They had moved because in the Torah, and then the Injil, which came with Isa ibn Maryam, and the Torah, which came with Musa alayhi salam, they were told that the greatest prophet, the chosen one, shall come out from the land of Paran. This is in the Bible today. It is the land of many dead palm trees. So they moved, and they recognized this is the place. For a long time, they were in Medina, not one, two, three years. Years, decades. And they used to say, this is the point here, the Jews that a prophet was about to rise. The Jews were saying, this is about time, man. that greatest prophet is coming. And that they will follow him, and they will kill the enemies, meaning the Arabs, Aus and Khazraj. The Jews of Medina used to say to the Aus and Khazraj, we will kill all of you, just like the children of Ad and Thamud. Why? Because you are idol worshippers and we will be the followers of that Prophet. So when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam met with them now in Mecca, these six people from Yathrib, they said, you know what, this sounds just like what the, the Yahud of Medina have been telling us. It sounds exactly like that. Page 176. When Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam met them, he asked them, who are you? They said, we are people of the tribe of Khazraj. He asked them, I mean, Mawal al you are from the allies of the Jews. Because Khazraj, the Jews allied with Khazraj in fighting Aus. Aus and Khazraj, the two Arabs are fighting. Khazraj, or the Jews, they allied with Khazraj. They said, yes. He said to them, then why won't you sit down and listen to what I have to say to you? They accepted that. So the offer was readily accepted. For the fame of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa had spread to Medina, and the strangers were curious to see more of the man who had created such a star uh, in the whole area. Now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was famous. Now everybody knew that, oh, there's this man in Mecca and he's causing problems. That's what they know, right? So obviously human beings, we have this quality called curiosity. MashaAllah, it's from Medina? Zakullah khair. Medina of Ottawa. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was famous. He had a reputation. So they said, why don't we sit and listen to him? Um, it says what? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam presented, sorry, an explanation of Islam to them. 
and its implications and the responsibilities that fell <coughs> upon those who accepted it. When the Prophet وسلم, concluded, concluded his talk, when the Prophet وسلم, concluded his talk, They exchanged among themselves ideas to the following effect. They said, no, surely. This is the prophet with whom the Jews are ever threatening us by. So, we should rush to be the ones who claim him first. If we follow him before the Jews, yes, he'll be ours. They therefore embraced Islam. Not only for that reason, so you don't have to misunderstand the words. It's one of the things they said to themselves. Remember, there are people who have just been fighting, 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 fighting. And they've been hearing from the Jews who are strong, economically and in weaponry, the Jews were strong, that we are just waiting for that prophet to come. When he comes, we'll do and we'll do, we'll do to you. So now they meet the, the, that prophet before they even know about it. The Jews don't even know about it. They say, you know what, this is our passport. So they accepted Islam. <clears throat> and they say to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam these important words. They said, <clears throat> I want to get the actual Arabic of it. إن قد تركنا قومنا ولا قوم بينهم من العداوة والشر ما بينهم. We left our people back in Medina, and there's no other people in this world who have so much enmity and infighting between them like our people. فعسى أن يجمعهم الله بك. Maybe you will be the reason Allah joins us, because any country, any people, you can just fight for so much. At the end of the day, you get tired of fighting. فَسَنَقْدُمُ عَلَيْهِمْ So we'll go back to our people. فَنَدْعُوهُمْ إِلَىٰ أَمْرِكَ And we'll tell them to become Muslim and follow you just like we have did. وَنَعْرِدُ عَلَيْهِمُ الَّذِي أَجَبْنَاكَ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ هَذَا الدِّينَ We'll tell them about this religion we have accepted. فَإِنْ يَجْمَعُهُمُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ فَلَا رَجُلَ أَعَزُّ بِكَ And if Allah accepts that they become Muslim, then nobody will become more noble than you. Because if we are your supporters, Nobody will become more stronger than you. Why? Because there are people who had Izzah. We'll talk about the Ansar. This is very, very, extremely important. These were the, from Medina, the coffee. Zakala khair. These were the seeds of the tree of Iman which is going to sprout, and its branches and leaves and fruits today have reached Ottawa. And they've reached every corner of the world. That's why I told you, those six men are very important. They're very important. So anyway, they went back to their people in Medina, and they called them to Islam. This is the 11th year. What time is it? So they went back to their people. Oh, let me stop here. Let me stop here for a bit. Um, do you guys have any questions of what we talked about right now? Just that, not any other questions. There's an opinion that the Jews, they saw the Prophet Sallallahu when he went to Medina with his mom, when he was young. Is that true? I don't know. I don't know. And even if they saw him like that, they wouldn't recognize him. 
from what I know. Because if that happened, the Jews would have rushed to protect him and to take him as their own. Or to kill him because they did not like the fact he was an Arab. That's why they never believed at the end. But none of that happened. That is why we'll see when the Prophet ﷺ went to Medina now, they had to test him. Is this actually the right, the, the, that Prophet? Now, yes. I can't hear you. Maybe you ask the other sisters to not chat also. Because it helps. Not chatting helps have a good class. Repeat again, please, sister. Like who? Now? Ah, Bahira the monk. Yeah, we talk about that, sister. Where you at? No, we talked about that in detail, in fact, yeah, right? And we proved how it's not right. That was like the second, third lecture. And how was it not right? We mentioned so many reasons. We mentioned so many reasons. It never happened. It never happened. The Prophet ﷺ was not that famous before prophethood. That's the fact. He was not famous. He was famous in Mecca. They loved him completely. But outside Mecca, they didn't know him. We're going to go to the Hijra today. You'll see that. People recognize Abu Bakr and say, Abu Bakr, who's this with you? <laughs> they knew Abu Bakr more than they knew the Prophet ﷺ. Because of the Abu Bakr was a trader, he was someone who used to speak to the people, you know. So those, those stories are not true. Uh, go back to Sira what they say. The videos are there. Any more questions? Yes. No, this is not the first Aqaba. This is the pre-Aqaba. We're going to go to the first Aqaba the next year now. And then it's going to be the second Aqaba. But they did meet at the place called Aqabas, you see. That is why some of the scholars, they said there's three Aqabas. And they count this as the first one. Any questions? If you have a question, just ask. I have to reply to my mom's text. She's about to sleep now, so. Ah. Okay, there's no questions. We're going to continue. Please, let's have one class. We're going to continue. So these six men, they went back to Medina. These six men, they went back to Medina. When they reached Medina, they had believed the Prophet Wasallam, of course. They built a masjid. And this was the first masjid to be built. Or you can say the first masjid to be built in Medina. And this was in the area of Bani Zuraiq, Bani Zuraiq, the tribe of Zuraiq. You know, the neighborhoods back then, they were labeled or named by the people who lived in them. This is the area of Banu Zuraiq, the area of Banu Abd Ashhal, and like that. So that is where the first masjid was built in Medina. Banu Zuraiq, Zuraiq. In English, you'll write Z-U-R-A-Y-Q. Bani Zuraiq.
Naam? No, that's not in the book. I'm not reading from the book anymore. I'm just giving you what I have here now. So, these were the first six people of Medina to accept Islam. They went back, they established this masjid in Bani Zuraiq. Um, <clears throat> what happened then is that they started to call their people to Islam. Now remember, where are we in the timeline? What time is it now? What, when during the 11th year? Come on, guys. They came for Hajj. When is Hajj? Hajj is Dhul Hijjah, the last month of the year. So this is the end of the 11th year. So we're going into the 12th year. While we're talking about that, never forget, in Mecca, it is still a hostile situation. The Muslims are being tortured, persecuted. They want to kill the Prophet ﷺ. But now we move our focus and shift to Medina. These people went back. They called their people for a whole year. During Hajj now of, of the 12th year now. The next year now, after one year, they came back for Hajj. And they did not come back as six people. They came back with a bigger group because other people had become Muslim. Because other people had become Muslim. They came 12 people, 10 of them from Khazraj and two of them from Aus. 10 of them from Khazraj and two of them from Aus. This is called the first Aqaba plague. And that is uh, page number 186. Page number 186. We're going to read from the book now. We have already spoken about the six Madanese who embraced Islam in the pilgrimage season, in the 11th year of prophethood. The following year, on the occasion of the Hajj again, there came a group of 12 people ready to acknowledge the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu as their Prophet. The, the group of men comprised of five of the six who had met the Prophet sallallahu before. Five of them came back. And the one who did not come back was Jabir ibn Abdullah ibn Ka'ab. And the other seven who came were, you have the names if you have the book, life is easy, life is good. Number one, Mu'adh ibn al-Harith ibn Afra. You memorize that name because we're going to mention him, a great man. This is not the famous Mu'adh ibn Jabal who narrates so many hadith, one of the greatest scholars of this ummah. This is Mu'adh ibn Harith ibn Afra. And Afra was his mother. Some people, they became famous by being called by their mother. Muhammad, the son of uh, Fatima, because Fatima was famous. Anyway, his father was Al-Harith, his mother was Afra. And he was from the Khazraj. Zakwar ibn Abdul Qais, also from the Khazraj. Ubada ibn Sabit, one of the great companions. Ubada ibn Sabit. Yazid ibn Tha'laba, Al-Abbas ibn Ubad ibn Nadla, and Abu Al-Haytham ibn Tayhan, Abu Al-Haytham ibn Tayhan, and Uwaib ibn Sa'ida from Aus. They affirmed, of course, they came as believers because those six people who returned to Medina gave them da'wah. They came as believers. They met with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Al-Bukhari recorded that Ubad ibn Sabit narrated that the Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam met with them at Aqaba also. Twelfth year. This is known as the first Aqaba pledge. Because now things are serious. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took a pledge from them. A covenant, a promise, a treaty. Ubad ibn Sabit he says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he called them and he said بَايِعُونِي عَلَىٰ عَلَىٰ أَلَّا تُشْرِكُوا بِاللَّهِ شَيْئًا وَلَا تَسْرِقُوا وَلَا تَزْلُوا وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَوْلَادَكُمْ وَلَا تَأْتُوا بِبُهْتَانِ تَفْتَرُونَهُ بَيْنَ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَأَرْجُلِكُمْ وَلَا تَعْسُوا فِي مَعْرُوفٍ فَمَنْ وَفَّى مِنْكُمْ فَأَجْرُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ وَمَنْ أَصَابَ بِذَلِكَ شَيْءٍ فَعُوقِبَ بِهِ فِي الدُّنْيَا فَهُوَ كَفَّارَةٌ لَهُ وَمَنْ أَصَابَ بِذَلِكَ شَيْءٍ ثُمَّ سَتَرَهُ اللَّهُ وَهُوَ إِلَى اللَّهِ إِشَاعَةً فَعَلَهُ وَإِشَاعَةً 
That was the content of the pledge, the agreement. It says here in English, the Prophet ﷺ said to them, come here and pledge to me. That what? You'll give me your money. You'll marry, me. You'll marry your daughters to me. You'll make me your king. I'm the supreme leader. There's no elections anymore. You'll have no leader until I die, then my son. No, none of that. Come here and pledge allegiance to me that you will not associate anyone with Allah, Tawheed, from the beginning to the end. That is what I want from you. <coughs> that you will not steal. لا تسرق, you will not steal. ولا تزلو, you will not commit zina, unlawful sexual intercourse. ولا تقتل أولادكم, you will not kill your children. We mentioned how the Arabs used to do that. And you will not utter slander, intentionally forging falsehood. Muhtan, false testimony, making up things. And you will not disobey in any good. Everything which Allah says do, you will not disobey. Now listen to this. Whoever fulfills this, Allah will reward him. And whoever neglects anything of that, meaning he commits a sin, and he is afflicted in this world, Allah tests him with a test. He becomes sick, he loses his money. The tests, there are reasons for your sins to be expiated. Whoever is afflicted with anything, it may prove redemption for him in the hereafter. And if the sin remains hidden from the eyes of the man, and no grief comes to him, then his affairs with Allah. Meaning if the sin is just between you and Allah, then it's between you and Allah. If Allah wants, he'll forgive you. If he wants, he'll punish you. That is the pledge they gave. Pay attention. Do you see zakah there? Do you see psalm of Ramadan? It is very simple. But it is the deen at that time. You'll not worship anyone but Allah. You'll not steal. You'll not kill. You'll not commit zina. And you'll not bring falsehood and slander on each other. And everything you've been told to summarize, because the Prophet cannot tell them this and that, and you have to obey your parents and speak good. And, but everything you've been told to do, you won't disobey. If you disobey and you're punished, that is the kafar, expiation. If not, tomorrow is between you and Allah. If Allah wants, He'll forgive you. If he wants, he'll punish you. And they gave him the pledge. You know, uh, Ubad ibn Samit, he says, we gave the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the pledge, the pledge of women. The pledge of bay'atul nisa. Why did he call it the pledge of women? Now? No, there's no woman. Is no woman. No. No, that's not true. This is why memorizing the Quran is very important, Ikhwan. There's an end of a certain surah. Surah al mubtahira What does the end of Surah al mubtahira say? Uh, and then, the last one, Ya Ayyuhal Nabiyu, slowly sister, Ya Ayyuhal Nabiyu, O Prophet, uh -huh. Ida jaaka al mu'minat yubayi'alaka, when the women come to you to give you the pledge, now this is in Medina later on, but this is the pledge of women, when the women come to you to give you the pledge, of doing what? Same thing we just mentioned, Allah, They'll never commit shirk. And then, they'll never steal. Wala yaznun, they'll never commit zina. Wala yatina, bi muhtarin, they'll never commit slander and forging things. And then, wala yasina ka fi ma'roof, they do everything they're supposed to do, they don't disobey. Fabaya'ahulna, give them the bay'ah. He says, oh ba'da, later on, because this hadith is later on, he says, we gave the Prophet ﷺ the bay'ah, which was like the bay'ah of women. 
Because the bear of bear is different. The bear of bear is after you're going to stand up and fight for Allah's religion. And the bear after also changed. You see here, there's no hudud. You'll see next is coming soon. They'll be told if you commit error of the sins and the hudud are applied on you, the capital punishment, if you steal, your head is cut. You understand? If you kill, you're killed. It was not yet here. I want you to look at the difference so you know when you read a text, you know the timeline of it in the seerah. Because later on it became the bay of Risa. Later on, because this hadith, Ubadah bin Samit is narrating it after they're in Medina, probably after the death of the Prophet. You understand? It's called Bay'at al Nisa because that's the Bay'at women give. So they gave that pledge. Now this changed everything. Now the Prophet has supporters from outside. Now everything has changed. We'll stop here, prepare for Salatul Asr, and come back right after Asr, insha'Allah. Allah.